Walter Pitson in Remembered Day. A story of a famous answer by Abraham Lincoln on the Cavalcade of America, sponsored by the DuPont Company, maker of better things for better living through chemistry. First, here is Gaines Whitman. Today, it's especially smart to take good care of your clothes. One way you can do that is by having them clean regularly. This is another way that DuPont Chemistry stands ready to help you. Choose a dry cleaner who uses DuPont fluids per clean and tri clean because these fluids are especially compounded for expert cleaning. Your clothes will be cleaner because they are thorough. More pleasant to wear because DuPont fluids leave no odor. Because DuPont fluids don't leave any oily film to catch dust or dirt. Make sure your dry cleaner uses DuPont cleaning fluids. They are among DuPont's better things for better living through chemistry. Company presents Remembered Day, starring Walter Pigeon as Abraham Lincoln on the Cavalcade of America. For two days now, hundreds of strangers have been coming into a Pennsylvania town. And much of the coming and going centers around the great house on the square. Now it is Wednesday, November 18th. The last of many messengers has come and gone. And the house stands expectant in the afternoon sun. But along the street on which the house stands, many of the strangers keep passing. Hey, lad, uh, just a moment. Yes, mister? Are you a senator or something? <laughs> no, just a reporter for the New York Herald. Oh, well, this is the house, all right. This is where he's going to stay the night. Judge Wilson. I hadn't finished my question. Jamie Wills is my friend. We go to school again. Well, you give a great deal of information. There's some more, too. A captain stand there. A stranger. Confederate captain he is, too. He's wounded and he can't see. Well, you don't say. Elizabeth takes care of him. Elizabeth is Jamie Wills' sister. She likes him a lot. And, uh, would that be Elizabeth playing the piano? Sure. But I'm not allowed to talk to strangers. Goodbye, mister. <laughs> Please come here. Oh, yes, Daniel. Where are you? Right beside you. Well, give me a hand. Elizabeth, there's much I've been wanting to say, but I... Well, I'm a guest in this house. Oh, but you're so welcome here, Daniel. I know. You took me out of that hospital tent and brought me here when the weather began turning cold. And that was kind. We didn't single you out because of pity. All the men were moved out of the hospital tents in the houses here in town. You're a man as well as ours. But we are more than strangers here. Enemies. Has anyone made you feel that? Oh, I'd almost forgotten. Until today? Because he is coming to this house? Yes. Before the sun goes down, he'll be here. But, Daniel, please try to understand. You're so eager about his coming that it glows in your voice. But I'm not. And I don't want to pretend. I understand. And yet, somehow it's so right. To me, so very right. That both of you should be in this house. Why? Tell me why. It's just a feeling I have. Oh, I wish I could explain it to you, share it with you, but I can't. The sun shines, the wind is dropped. Tomorrow will be fair. The fields are warm with the flame of Indian summer. This is to be a day I shall long remember. before noon of this day, Wednesday, the 18th of November, a special four-car train marked with flags and bunting leaves Washington, D.C. and heads north and east. On board are newspaper men, three cabinet ministers, ministers and attaches of foreign governments, two presidential secretaries, and the one man for whom the train is being run. approaches its next stop after Baltimore, a group of men in a forward car sit telling stories. <laughs> very good, General. Very good indeed. Have you heard that one, Mr. President? Well, never did. Reminds me of our friend, General Fry. All morning, he kept fretting and worrying that I'd missed the 
train. Made me feel like that fellow back in Illinois who was going to be hung. As he came down the road on the way to the gallows, the crowd kept pushing and blocking his passage. Finally, the poor man called out, Boys, you needn't be in such a hurry to get ahead. There won't be any fun till I get there. <laughs> well, gentlemen, this is all very pleasant, but I must go to my car. Hey, no, 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 please keep your seat. No. Can I do anything, sir? No, I don't think so, Mr. Nicolay. The people will expect me to say something tomorrow, and I must give the matter some thought. If uh, I should need you, Mr. Nicolay, I'll call. Yes, sir. Perhaps you should close the door, Mr. Nicolay. I'd better leave it open in case he does call. Hmm. Yes. Despite his good humor, he's worried. Chickamauga crushed his hope for a near end to the war. That's right, Mr. Seward. And to the last minute, he debated about leaving Washington, even for a day. Dad's a very sick boy. The doctors have tried to be cheerful about it. Oh, the shock of Willie's death last year is still with him. One son gone, Dad is now his whole life. Stanton promised to telegraph any news. Oh, I hope it comes soon. The speech for tomorrow. Has he finished? No. Hardly forgot. Nothing beyond the few lines he set down at the White House. But the president has been living through every minute. There's something he sees. I've watched him. He has listened to her, but always it's as if he's listening and looking for something beyond the man speaking and the room in which he speaks. As if he's trying to make out a voice. A sign, a word. What is he looking for? Oh, Lord, thou hast persuaded me. I was convinced. Thou art stronger than I and has prevailed. I am in derision daily. Everyone mocked me. For when I spake, I cried out. I cried violent and spoiled. Because the word of the Lord was made a reproach. And a derision. Undoubtedly, many sharp noses will smell this out as a deep bit of politics. Huh? <laughs> uh, how about Seward? He's to stay with a family called Harper. Mm-hmm. He'll be close by us. The others are all provided for, too. In accordance with each man's view of his position, I trust. Hmm, let us hope for the best. <laughs> and the beyond for the worst. <laughs> ah, this is rich and lovely country we're passing through. Yes, Mr. Nicolay, I've noticed. Especially these hills. They raise themselves before you and there's no question. No doubt. Just a fixed purpose. Oh, man. Still no word from Stanton? Not yet, Mr. President. Mm. But we'll undoubtedly hear from him before the day is out. Shall I uh, bring in the newspapers? No, oh, I've seen them. The story is the same in all. Grant and Sherman expecting trouble at Chattanooga. Burnside expecting trouble at Knoxville. Me doing likewise on the Rapidan. But it's strange how being on this train makes me feel cut off from everything. Uh, the speech, Mr. President, is there anything I can do? No, thank you. Not much I can do either. Uh, I will have to wait for later tonight. It's no secret that Congressman Stevens, as the big power in the party, disapproves of your making the speech tomorrow. I'm afraid that's so. When he heard I was going to the dedication and that Stanton and Chase were staying in Washington, he said it was the way it should be. Let the dead go bury the dead. Stevens is no fool. He may be right. Late that November afternoon, the train pulled into the Pennsylvania town. Now the sun has gone down. The town is silent. Within an hour or so, the townspeople and strangers and serenading bands will crowd into the streets and lanes in the town square. But now is the time for supper. In the east, the moon hangs low and full, blood red. And will, uh, will you sit here, Mr. President? Thank you, ma'am. Mother, why is the captain leaving in his room? Now, Daisy, you promised us we'd let you come to the table. Yes, mother. I'm sorry. Mr. President, would you do us the honor? Thank you. The honor is mine, Judge Will. For the 
bounty of thy fields and flocks and streams for the fruits of thy bounty that we are about to receive. For this shelter in friendship and warmth, Lord, we give humble thanks. Amen. 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 Miss Elizabeth, meaning no offense, you folks may call this supper, but I feel like I've eaten my way through a full course meal. <laughs> <laughs> and you, Mr. Nicolay? The president just spoke for me, too, sir. Mother, can I have another piece of pumpkin pie? Oh, now, baby, can't I ever feel you? Sonny, this is prime pumpkin pie. Maybe uh, your ma let us share another piece. Wish you'd come here more often. <laughs> <laughs> now, that's right kind of you, son. I have a boy of my own about your age. What's his name? We call him Tad. Does he have a pony? Yes, he has. Mr. President, I'm afraid there'll be quite a bit of parading and serenading tonight. I trust it won't be too disturbing. Ah, not a bit, Judge. But I wish there was a better reason for the drumming and shouting. Your boy like this pony? Just fine. But uh, right now, Tad's a very sick boy. I'm sorry to hear about that. We're all sorry, baby. And we all hope that Tad will soon be well again. You're very kind, ma'am. Mr. President, I wonder if you've ever noticed that... Oh, Daniel, good heavens, he must have fallen. Well, please excuse me. I'd I better go up and see. Elizabeth, I'll go. No, please, Father. Thank you, Mr. Nicolay. 
Will you be coming down, sir? I've still some writing to do. Where are you off to? Well, I thought I'd join Hay and the others for a bit. Serenade's beginning. <laughs> so I hear. Good night, Mr. Nicolay. Establish thou the work of our hands upon us. Yea, the work of our hands establish thou it. Come in. Ah, oh, Miss Elizabeth, please come in. Oh, Mr. President, this is Captain Daniel Carter. Captain Carter, I'm right glad to see you. Thank you, sir. Come, take care of both of you. Oh, here, Daniel, you sit here. Captain, I'm sure grateful to you for coming to see me. Is there something you want to talk about, sir? Oh, much, Captain. But I, uh, I shan't impose upon you. I'm, I'm not quite the bad man hot from the pit. Uh, what command were you with? Six North Carolina, sir. Hoax Brigade, Early Division. Old Jubal Early, eh? First great general. But nothing like Jackson, sir. He was our best. He was one of our country's best. His death was probably great news to you. Great news? No, Captain. It wasn't. So I didn't come here to have anyone mock me. Oh, Daniel, please. Wait. Captain, you think I mocked you. Why? Well, sir. Captain, we are both deeply troubled men, but there would be no gain for either of us in mockery or bitterness or in a false joy at the time of the death of a man, any man who was an American, whether the color of his uniform was blue or gray. What do you say, Captain? I, I don't know, sir. All I know is that when they brought me in from the field, I lay in darkness for three months. And in those three months, I did a lot of thinking, sir. I thought about the men in my company, my friends. Yes, and I thought about the Yankees, too, buried out there with the men I knew. And did you reach a conclusion, Captain? No. No, sir. All I could think of was, why? What for? I've walked in darkness for three years, searching an answer to those same questions. Why? What for? And I was not lacking for answers. Men came to me from every state, from foreign countries. They brought me advice and answers. I was like that fellow on the frontier who was lost one night in a most wild place. A terrific thunderstorm came up. The lightning gave him the only clue to his way out. But the thunder was frightful. One bolt, which seemed to crash the earth right beneath him, brought him to his knees. By no means a praying man, his petition was shortened to the point. Oh, Lord, if it's all the same to you, give us a little more light and a little less noise. And, Captain, I'm still seeking more light. Sir, I have no light to give. But there must be certain things in this world that are right for every man, and certain things that are dead wrong. There must be. Yes, Captain, that I can answer. Greed, intolerance, hatred, those are great wrongs. No matter the outcome of this war, if this country is to exist, if the world is to exist, then understanding and tolerance and brotherhood must become and remain a great right. Those are words, sir. Fine words. And I believe them. And will you dare to speak them tomorrow? Daniel, please. Will you dare to speak them tomorrow? To those who will be expecting glory and all the fine things that come with it? I have it in my mind, too. To whom will you speak? To all who would listen. There'll be many who will refuse. There'll be thousands on that field who would listen if they could. But they are dead. Yours and ours. And they won't be here, no matter what you say. I know, Captain. I know. Sir, I don't know how you're going to say it tomorrow. But those who are living, make them understand and see. Make them understand so that these Americans won't have died in vain. Captain Carter, for the best poor words I can muster, I will speak to all who will listen. Davy, Davy. Huh? Oh, Liz. Davy, did you see Captain Carter? 
Why, sure. Well, then he did come to the dedication after all. Sure. He's over on that mound, see? Oh, yes, uh huh. But wait here, Daisy. But Liz, he said he didn't want anybody around him. Liz! dedicated to the great task remaining before us, that from these honored dead we take increased devotion to that cause for which they gave the last full measure of devotion, that we here highly resolve that these dead shall not have died in vain, that this nation under God shall have a new birth of freedom and that government of the people, by the people, for the people, shall not perish from the earth. Miss Elizabeth, Captain Carter, it's right kind of you to come to say goodbye. I heard your speech this afternoon. I I tried to find the words, Captain. The right words, but I'm afraid it didn't. They they were right for me. And they they were right for the men who fell there. Thank you, Captain. Mr. President, my soldiering days are over. I mean the kind of soldiering that made me this way. But I'm enlisting again, sir. Enlisting? Yes, sir. Those words you spoke. They're a banner for all of us, whether northern or southern, for the years when this war is over. And I'm joining under that banner, sir, and serving for a life spell. Thank you, Captain. I'm afraid it's a poor, small force that you're joining. But it will grow into a great army one day, sir. And I want to go home to recruit for it. I see. Has Mr. Nicolay given you the pass? He has. And I'm deeply grateful to you, sir. But I'd, I'd like to ask one more favor, Mr. President. Could you see your way clear to write just three words on that pass? Go on, Captain. Well, sir, just after you say Captain Carter, would you add, and Mrs. Carter? Yes, I could do that, Captain. Does he speak for you, Miss Elizabeth? Oh, yes, Mr. President. I shall never forget this day. Child, sending you two off is the only thing today that has made me forget my condition or given me any pleasure. Die when I may. I want it said of me by those who knew me best that I plucked a thistle and planted a flower where I thought a flower would grow. cavalcade microphone in a moment. Now, here is Gaines Whitman. According to the National Safety Council, 355,000 deaths from accident in the scant four years between Pearl Harbor and VJ Day. 100,000 more deaths here at home than there were on the battlefields. It's hard to believe, isn't it? But it's true. Carelessness is a worse destroyer than the most destructive war in our history. And where do these accidents happen? The most dangerous place is your own home. Sixteen million persons were injured at home during the war years. How? That's a worthwhile question. For if you know how accidents occur in the home, you can take precautions against them. And the answer is largely from fires and from falls. Injuries from fire, reported daily in the newspapers, are caused by such things as children playing with matches, starting a furnace with kerosene or gasoline forgetting to adjust the screen around the fireplace, smoking, using worn-out electrical cords and plugs. How do people injure themselves in falls? By slipping in a bathtub or on a wet bathroom floor, or by slipping on icy walks and porch steps, by skidding on a rug, 
especially a rug at the head of the stairs. In this connection, the DuPont Company for many years has manufactured rug anchor, rug underlay, and it's back on the market. A synthetic sponge rubber, non-skid underlay, which fits under a rug or carpet and prevents just this type of fall that is so common and so dangerous. Not only are accidents in the home increasing, but traffic accidents are at an all-time high in spite of the fact that fewer cars are on the road. The tragedy is that almost all of these so-called accidents are unnecessary. All we need to do is use a little care. Industry proves it daily. In its safety record, the DuPont Company is a leader among American industrial companies. And we find in our experience that carefulness prevents fires and safeguards against personal injuries. Be careful and you'll be safe. That simple rule can be as effective in your own home as it is in the safe plant in which DuPont men and women make the DuPont companies better things for better living through chemistry. Now here is our star, Walter Pitchin. Thank you. It was a great pleasure having you with us tonight, Walter. Doubly so because of your splendid performance. Thanks, Quain. The pleasure was mine. History has always interested me, but I don't remember ever having known what the inspiration was for Lincoln's magnificent Gettysburg Address. John Salk's enlightening story was new to me, and, and I like to learn new things. In that case, Walter, you'll be interested in next week's Cavalcade story. How's that? Well, it's a story based on a little-known incident in the life of another of our great friends. Oh, yes, a very good friend of mine was telling me about it, a fellow by the name of Gregory Peck, who, uh, I believe he's the star in the story. Correct. He's played a title role in Young Major Washington. Incidentally, have you ever worked with Gregory Peck? No, not yet. You mean to say he isn't in Weekend at the Waldorf? <laughs> no, he isn't, Wayne. Although the uh, picture is full of stars... Including you, Mr. Pigeon. Yes, I managed to squeeze into Waldo for a weekend. Uh, well, well, together I'm, with... Uh, I'm uh, sorry, Walter, but we have just so much time on the air, and what that we have left would allow for a full roll call of stars in Weekend at the Waldorf. Well, uh, will I have time to say goodnight? Oh, yeah, sure. You'll have time to say goodnight. Very well. Good night. <laughs> Boy Scouts Week. While statesmen of the world work for permanent peace, the Boy Scouts make their own contributions to understanding among all peoples. Without any fanfare, our American Scouts, through their World Friendship Fund, are helping their comrades in war-devastated countries. We salute the Boy Scouts and their theme, Scouts of the World, Building Together. Tonight's DuPont Cavalcade was composed and conducted by Robert Armbruster. The Cavalcade play was written by John Sox and Milton Wayne. In tonight's cast with Mr. Pigeon were Sammy Hill, Alan Hewitt, Jay Novello, Georgia Backus, Griff Barnett, Henry Blair, Tommy Bernard, and David Ellis. This is Tom Collins inviting you to listen next week to Gregory Peck in Young Major Washington on the Cavalcade of America, brought to you by the DuPont Company of Wilmington, Delaware. NBC, the national broadcasting company.